Kia ora, good afternoon everybody and welcome along to this Victoria University Spotlight Lecture Series. I am Lisa Marriott and I work at the business school over the road and I do teach taxation there. And I'm here today with my colleague in the front row here, Mike Berridge, who is a research professor at the Maligan Institute of Medical Research. And we are here to talk to you about whether there is an appetite for a sugar tax in New Zealand, which has proven to be a particularly topical issue if you've been watching the media this week. So what we're going to talk about today is I'm going to start and I'm going to talk to you about uh, whether the tax system can be used to influence individuals' consumption choices. And then Mike will take over and he will talk about whether the tax system should be used to influence people's consumption behaviour. Uh, so we'll talk for about maybe 15, 20 minutes each, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So of course the issue, uh, the primary issue that we're focusing on here is, uh, is obesity, and I am going to leave the, the health component of this over to Mike to talk about as the medical expert, but I'll just give you um, a little bit of an introduction by saying that obesity is a factor in a number of health uh, issues, so heart disease, type 2 diabetes, some cancers and dental issues, particularly amongst younger children. Uh, the slightly different thing when it comes to obesity is, of course, unlike many other disorders, it is preventable, which is, um, and it has also become one of the um, largest preventable uh, causes of disease, and it's overtaken tobacco in that respect as well. So a couple of figures just to show you by way of background before I get into the research. So this is from the Ministry of uh, Health. Uh, the proportion of the New Zealand population aged 15 years and over who are obese. So this is not overweight, this is obese. So this is the uh, BMI, body mass index, uh, greater than 30. So just by way of uh, giving you the numbers here, the, the uh, groups at the top here, so age 55 to 64, 38% uh, of the population there are classified as obese, 65 to 74, 37% uh, there, and also 45 to 54 age group, uh, that is about 36%. So quite high figures there. When you put this into our context where we sit in relation to the OECD, um, and these are figures as a percentage of the population. We are under World Health Organization measures and OECD measures uh, third uh, ranked only behind the US uh, at 35% and Mexico at 32%. So um, not a great place really to be sitting there. The interesting thing here is the US and various states in the US, they have tried to implement sugar taxes of various types, and Mexico a couple of years ago also introduced a sugar tax, and I will talk a little bit about that as we go through this a little bit more. Okay, so what does the research say on this? Now, I've just put up a few studies here. There are multiple studies that tend to say pretty much exactly the same thing, which is that if you take something, it changes behavior. We're rational people. We respond to price signals. The issue is just how much we respond and what that price signal has to be to get the response that you might want. So, Let's start with some of this, and I'm going to talk about food to start with, and then I will talk about sugar-sweetened beverages, so soft drinks uh, on the next slide. So the modelling studies, plenty of modelling studies out there that do suggest that behavioural changes will follow from either a, a price reduction or a price increase. So studies have been done on either of these, so um, one to uh, increase purchasing and one to decrease purchasing. So this uh, Danish study here, what they did was they modelled behaviour, so purchasing behaviour from 2,000 consumers based on uh, food consumed at home. So it is a model, but it's based on uh, price elasticities based on purchasing behaviours. And what happened with this study, so they, had, um, they looked at various nutritional components, so they looked at what happened if you taxed on fats and taxed on sugars and so on. But for the purposes of looking at, at just what happened with the sugar component, uh, 
it, changing the, the VAT component, so which was about 25%, did reduce demand by, actually it was about 22%, but certainly over 20%. So that certainly is achieving the objective there. Um, the interesting thing with most of these studies is they all do tend to agree as well that you see the greatest behavioural change in young people, and it is the 14 to 18 year old group which is a, a particular sort of offender, if you like, with the, the unhealthy foods and the, the soft drinks, uh, but also it's lower income earners where you tend to see the greatest behavioural change as well, you know, perhaps unsurprisingly the most price sensitive. So this study confirms that as well, but most studies do tend to agree that you see the greatest behavioural will change uh, exactly where you need it to be. Now, there have been some nice studies done out of the US where there is observational data collected on purchasing behaviour, and this is a purchasing outside of the home. So I've got a couple of these here. So this first one is where prices and vending machines have been uh, manipulated. So you have a, a baseline where you observe sales behaviour. So in this particular one here in the US, they had some healthy snacks that they sold at a standard price, a baseline price for four weeks. They reduced that price by... 50% for three weeks, and then returned it to the original price for three weeks. And what they saw in that time period was the, an increase of about 80%. Um, so the purchasing went from, with these healthy snacks, it was originally 20%, sorry, 26% of total sales, increased to 46% of to, uh, total sales during that intervention. Uh, so 50% decrease resulting in an 80% sort of change of behaviour. Another study which took place in workplaces, again in the US, actually this is workplaces and secondary schools, they manipulated prices again with healthy foods and they sold them under three different interventions. So when the prices were reduced by 10%, sales increased by 9%. When they sold them at a reduction of 25%, sales increased by 39%. And then when they uh, reduced the price by 50%, sales increased by 93%. So you can see there, in order to get the significant behavioural change, the price signal needs to be very, very high. And what this does, well, two issues highlighted from this particular, the, the, the studies, types of studies here. You do, in order to get the significant behavioural change, these price signals are probably going to need to be at a limit well above what any government is likely to ever want to introduce. Uh, and secondly, with these types of studies, they're always short-term in nature. So three, four, five, six weeks, sometimes a few months in nature for the, the observational studies where you're collecting uh, the observation data, which is why there is some concern around how, um, how long-term some of these behavioural changes might be. Because we do know that you get behavioural change in the short term, but whether that's permanent or whether people would adjust to, those, um, to the increased price and revert to the original behaviour is one of the factors which is, is less known. Okay, so sugar-sweetened beverages, so soft drinks. And these are the area where we've seen most of the taxes targeted in overseas jurisdictions. So a lot of US states have targeted or attempted to target uh, taxes on, on these types of, um, uh, of goods. But the reason why these are sort of an easy target, if you like, is because they, it's, it's hard to argue that they have much in the way of nutritional benefit, usually. Uh, they are also one of the largest sources of sugar in a Western diet. And there is some quite strong links between consumption of these sugar-sweetened uh, drinks and obesity. And I know Mike is going to talk to you about that uh, in a wee bit um, when he starts his presentation. So you know, it's probably not at all surprising that it is this type of product which has been targeted mostly for behavioural change. Now I've put some studies up here just to give you a bit of an indication of the types of results that we see from these types of studies. There's one, a quite recent one out of Australia, which suggests that if we had a 20% increase in prices of um, sugar-sweetened beverages, 
4,400 fewer cases of heart disease would result, 1,100 fewer strokes, and a further 1,600 people would be alive. Now, as well as on top of that, there are some good cost savings to be held had here. But notice that these cost savings are actually just in the health system. So the cost savings within the health system alone are 600 odd million, but that's over quite a long period of time, 25 years. Uh, but also because uh, these types of taxes are revenue positive, there are gains to be had in addition to the savings in the cost system. So this 609 million is here, sorry, the health system. So the savings in the health system are the 600 million, but there's revenue generated on top of that. Now, some of the other modelling that you see around with these types of taxes, uh, from the US, a 10% tax is uh, forecast to reduce sales by just under 4.8%. It's modelling out of Norway, a 27% increase in the price of these uh, soft drinks is predicted to reduce consumption between 17% for lighter consumers, 44% uh, for heavier consumers. Now, in the US, they've adopted this approach, which you see quite often. They call it a, a penny per ounce uh, type of subsidy, and oh, sorry, tax even, and it accounts to around about sort of 15 to 20 percent tax on a sugar sweetened beverage, and a tax of that type of um, size is estimated to result in about just under a 24 percent reduction in consumption. Uh, and then one other longitudinal study there which looked at behavioural changes on food, uh, certain types of food and drinks, su uh, suggested a 10% increase in price was associated with a 7% reduction in consumption. So what you can see from these studies is, you know, they are reasonably consistent. You can see the smaller taxes here, the 10% the type of taxes, we're getting behavioural changes of maybe sort of 5 to 7% reductions in consumption. The larger taxes, the 27% here, 15 to 20% here, they are getting the more significant behavioural changes. Now, Mike is going to talk to you a lot more about this, but one of the things that we do hear about in the media is that there's, it's hard to make this link between uh, consumption of sugar or consumption of uh, soft drinks and so on and obesity, whereas in fact there are quite a few studies that do tend to suggest that that link is, is really quite, uh, quite clear and present. So I have put a couple of quotes here from studies, and you can see the comments here. There's a positive association between greater intakes of sugar-sweetened beverages and weight gain and obesity in both children and adults. Uh, and the second point, clear associations of soft drink intake with increased energy intake and, and body weight. And again, the research um, is fairly clear on these points. Now, as with all taxes, it's never all going to be all um, in one direction. There are certainly some issues with using the tax system to try and change behaviour. Now, the first one, and it's particularly important for uh, the sorts of tax that we're talking about here, is these taxes tend to be regressive. And by regressive, I mean that the burden falls on the lowest income earners the most. Um, the, I guess the thing with these particular taxes as well is that, in fact, it is the lower income earners who are the target here as well. So to a certain extent, you can actually argue, argue that it's, sort of, it, it's achieving what it's supposed to be achieving. But there are some studies out there that suggest that uh, the lower income earners would pay seven times as much of this tax than higher income earners. And that's just because of the way the, where the, the proportionate balance of the, the tax would end up. Now, I mentioned the GST system here, uh, actually not because it's an issue, but because it's often raised as an issue as to why we couldn't or shouldn't have a sugar tax. Now, the our GST system in New Zealand is very good. It collects a high amount of revenue at a relatively low rate, 15%. And I think anybody who works in tax or knows anything about tax would not want to see the GST system tampered with or um, tinkered with to try and achieve uh, behavioural changes around food consumption. And this is raised as an argument as to why we shouldn't have a sugar tax. However, a sugar tax wouldn't 
go, or wouldn't be part of the GST system. It's much more likely to take the form of an excise tax. So an excise tax is a tax on a specific good or service on a, a per unit base. So something like a sugar tax would be a tax on um, a certain percentage on grams of sugar in a product, for example. It wouldn't just be a standard 15% on top of a product that has sugar in it. So in fact, the GST argument doesn't really hold as creating any particular types of problems as to why we should uh, introduce a, um, a sugar tax. Now, timing. The studies do tend to um, be short-lived in nature, so a lot of the research doesn't actually show us mo what might happen over time. I mentioned to you when we started that uh, Mexico introduced a sugar tax. Now, that's been in place, I think, for about two years now. And after about a year, it was reported as showing some quite significant behavioural changes. Uh, however, in more recent times, there has been some suggestion, although it's not academically reported as yet, there has been some suggestion that some of those behaviours have, have uh, tapered off a little bit. So the question does remain about how permanent some of those changes might be. Uh, and of course, government intervention. Um, we in New Zealand don't have a strong history of using the tax system to change behaviour or to try to influence people's behaviour. Uh, and of course, something like food consumption is very much a, a personal choice. And uh, there's certainly a lot of people who would think that the government shouldn't get involved in, in individuals' uh, private eating decisions. And, and that's a perfectly uh, valid reason as well. Uh, except to say that the burden on the health system uh, is significant as a result of the issues around obesity. And studies do suggest that obese individuals incur at any given time a 30% higher medical expenditure uh, than someone of a healthy weight. And of course, taxes like this are revenue positive. If you uh, take into account the compliance costs that will be associated with it and the costs of collection, they're still very much likely to be revenue positive. They're not going to generate a, a, an enormous amount of revenue, but they will generate some revenue. Now, what I've just popped up here is some policy interventions. These are from a, um, a medical journal uh, published a few years ago. There's a range here of different types of policy interventions that are all cost-saving, this is to the economy, when the net cost of a, a disability-adjusted life year is taken into account. And basically, a disability-adjusted life year is <coughs> one lost year of healthy life. Now, you can see here that, in fact, uh, well, there's a, there's a tax targeted at adults, and there is food labelling. So this is like traffic light labelling on the fronts of food packages, that type of thing. Uh, but apart from those two, a lot of these interventions are aimed at children. So this is uh, limiting advertising of um, fast food and so on and beverages to children. Lots of education-type plans, again, through schools or social marketing. Uh, and there's only one medical solution uh, there at the end, which is just aimed at a very small portion of the population. Now, I'm just going to conclude by saying that certainly based on the research, sugar taxes are likely to result in behavioural changes, but there are some things that do need to be resolved. So whether that behaviour would be short or long term, the size that the tax would need to be really uh, is uh, an, an unknown as well. What we do know is the larger the tax will be, then the greater the behavioural change, but larger taxes are going to be politically unacceptable. And the third thing there to consider is the optimal form of such a tax. And there is general agreement that one policy instrument in isolation is not the best outcome. So combining a, a financial uh, signal with some other type of policy instrument, so education is normally the one that is uh, is, uh, goes alongside the financial instruments. So education, social marketing, food labelling, all those types of things, uh, and restricted advertising as well. Now, the last thing I'll say is, of course, even apart from all those issues that we've talked about, there is something to be said for the signalling benefit that goes alongside a government putting in place a sugar tax. The signal on its own sends a very clear message that this is a behaviour which is, you know, behaviours which are undesired and the consumption of these products is, you know, perhaps something that we shouldn't, um, should think twice about. Now... That's it from me. I'm going to hand over to Mike, and Mike is going to talk to you 
a wee bit more about the a very important medical side of this issue. Thank you, Mike. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks very much. And it's a pleasure to, to be here to, to talk with you. Um, <clears throat> What I want, I'll declare first of all I have no conflict of interest and that the views that I'm going to express are not necessarily those of the institution that I work for. Now, what I want to do is to talk uh, more about the health issues um, surrounding uh, sugar taxes and uh, sugar in, in a, uh, by itself. Um, some of these issues have already been mentioned. Um, but I think that uh, sugar consumption uh, goes into many other health areas that we don't usually associate. Overweight and obesity, type 2 diabetes are those things we know about, we hear about all the time. Um, gestational diabetes, metabolic syndrome, which in fact uh, approaches uh, obesity as a, uh, as a problem, as a disease in its own right. I couldn't find any New Zealand information on this, but it's a significant problem in the US and we're not far behind. Cardiovascular diseases, about uh, nearly half of type 2 diabetics uh, will progress to cardiovascular diseases. Dental decay, a massive problem in young children, um, and there are more than 5,000 children in New Zealand who have their teeth extracted under general anaesthetic each year. Uh, and the costs are enormous. And a new area that really has not received much attention is the area of brain damage and behavioural issues surrounded, uh, surrounding sugar consumption. And these, uh, in general, relate to stress responses. Um, in general, this is quite recent work, but certainly modelling in rats shows that there are uh, major issues with regard to brain function and uh, high sugar intake. And I think we all know that um, diseases like ADHD and um, behaviour in schools are very much related to sugar intake uh, and to fast food consumption. <coughs> so in New Zealand today, uh, diabetes, and when I say diabetes, I'm talking primarily about type 2 diabetes. Uh, the 10% of diabetics who are type 1 have a different disease, and I'm not going to be talking about those. So when I talk about diabetics, it's type 2. Uh, there are a quarter of a million of those in New Zealand at the moment, um, double the number there were in 2005. There are also 100,000 undiagnosed uh, diabetics. <coughs> if you look across the population, one in four of us are pre-diabetic. By pre-diabetic, it means we have the symptoms that in five years, or 10 years, I think, 50% will progress to full-blown type 2 diabetes. Maori are much more likely to get diabetes than non-Maori, and in New Zealand, the highest incidences are with the Indian population, with Pacific, and with Maori peoples. Adult Onset diabetes, which it was when I grew up, has now become uh, a childhood epidemic as well. And one in three Kiwi kids are obese, and one in three adults are overweight or obese. The costs are colossal, and the costs will escalate significantly over the next five years to approaching $2 billion, and these may well be underestimates. The worldwide situation with type 2 diabetes is not that different from that in New Zealand. <coughs> and this just compares across uh, the latest World Health Organization data across uh, the different regions, and you can see that the Western Pacific has almost doubled its diabetes uh, incidence um, since 1980. <coughs> the causes? Sugar and highly processed foods are indisputably, or what we call junk foods, are indisputably the, the major issue around uh, type 2 diabetes. There are many other lifestyle factors and choices that we make in our lives that contribute. 
Personal genetics is significant. And if any of you have read Robin Tumas' uh, recent book on fat science, this, will, uh, this points out the issue of the fat genes, the skinny genes. Some people are really um, almost don't have choice. Uh, hunger and aspects of control are quite different in people with FTR and other genes related to, um, uh, to obesity. So focusing on groups of people is probably not the best strategy. <coughs> Contributing factors, uh, Lisa mentioned advertising, overt and subtle. It's ingrained in our culture. It's there. We may think it's not, but we're um, exposed to this all the time. We have a number of habitual cultural practices. We live in an obesogenic society. And increasingly, given that 80% of us live in cities, uh, are addicted to uh, uh, computers and cell phones and, and those things that keep us connected with the internet, uh, we are not doing the amount of exercise that we should be doing. So how does sugar cause diabetes? Well, sugar goes straight into the bloodstream. As soon as it hits the stomach virtually or the small intestine, it's into your bloodstream. So it instantly causes increased um, glucose in your bloodstream. Sugar is sucrose plus an equal amount of fructose, but it's the glucose that we'll be talking about here. There are another set of problems around fructose that I really don't have time to go into. <coughs> So glucose normally causes the pancreas to produce insulin, and insulin acts on the tissues um, to take up glucose and convert it into fat. In the liver, it's also converted into glycogen. Um, so the major fat storage tissues, interestingly, the pancreas, which produces insulin, is one of the first and, and one of the significant areas uh, of fat accumulation. And I say that because accumulation of fat in the pancreas will blunt the ability of the pancreas to produce insulin. And so glucose just gets out of control. <clears throat> so excess glucose uh, produces uh, or causes overproduction of insulin. Um, as I mentioned, it blunts pancreatic and tissue response to insulin uh, by just fat accumulation, and that fat accumulation affects the normal control mechanisms in most of the tissues that are uh, affected. Um, sugar, highly processed starch foods, uh, result in weight gain, obesity, and diabetes. And the links between this I'll go into a little bit more, but I think the, uh, the evidence is pretty solid that those linkages, not just with, with weight, but with um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, are pretty well rock solid. And interestingly, uh, as was mentioned, diabetes is reversible. Um, there has been a very recent study, uh, and admittedly it involves bariatric surgery, but uh, taking one gram of fat off the pancreas will almost completely reverse the symptoms of, di of type 2 diabetes. And what happens when we have a meal? Well, glucose goes up. And as you can see here, after breakfast, lunch, and particularly dinner, glucose goes up quite quickly. Uh, this is a range uh, of glucose levels, the normal would be uh, nearer the center of this, but this is across a, a group. Um, <clears throat> and when glucose go up, goes up, this is followed by insulin being secreted by the, um, uh, by the pancreas, and that insulin acts to lower blood glucose, and insulin itself comes down quite quickly. And you can see there are bumps and humps here, partly because the glucose in our diet or the starches that are readily uh, made into uh, uh, sucrose and glucose um, will be cleared quite quickly, whereas um, uh, other um, more complicated starch foods uh, are a little, uh, cleared a little more slowly and um, 
complex carbohydrates and those things in fruit and vegetables, celluloses, of course, involve bacteria in our gut and they are ideal because they are processed, they release their sugars uh, quite slowly over a long period of time. Um, interestingly, there is a new hormone that's just been, or peptide hormone that's just been discovered that controls our fasting levels of glucose and that's highly elevated in type 2 diabetes. This is called asprosin and it uh, was just really, uh, the first evidence of this was just published last week in Cell. <coughs> so this is an ongoing, um, there's some ongoing knowledge generation around the control of glucose. And what happens in type 2 diabetes? Well, fasting glucose goes up with uh, time, slowly but insidiously. Your ability to clear glucose from the circulation goes up much more rapidly. So high glucose uh, in the circulation um, is a major issue. And high glucose in the circulation will over time lead to many, many different problems. Uh, many of these uh, related to what we call glycosylation or adding sugars to proteins, which destroys um, connective tissue, it destroys the circulatory system, and you will know the endpoints of type 2 diabetes, uh, 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 gangrene, amputation, renal disease, blindness. And those are the big clinical things that we don't see, but they're in the, our health system uh, and they are a major problem. With insulin secretion, that initially, as I mentioned, goes up and then comes down, Many type 2 diabetes, it will come down much more rapidly, this is an average, and they will become insulin dependent. And some won't come down as much, and they will be able to live with their diabetes without added insulin. Alongside this, um, there are vascular and microvascular complications which start quite early in the disease. The disease is usually diagnosed around this point, so uh, people who have high sugar consumption and uh, junk food diets will be in a pre-diabetic stage at a fairly, fairly early stage, way before diagnosis. And by the time of diagnosis, the disease has set in. We need to address this problem at its root source. Childhood obesity is a big problem. It has become a focus area of the World Health Organization and Sir Peter Gluckman, uh, advisor to the Prime Minister, has just, um, uh, has, was involved with, as chair of the commission. The commission member was Helen Clark. They made seven, six major recommendations. I'm not going to read them out, but the one I'm, uh, we're particularly interested today um, uh, is that promoting healthy intake or intake of um, healthy foods. And I'll just read out uh, one component of that implement, uh, to implement comprehensive programs that promote intake of healthy foods, reduce intake of unhealthy foods and sugar sweetened beverages by children and adolescents. And of course this advice applies across society. This is a societal problem, not just a childhood problem. And one of the measures uh, they advise is through effective taxation measures on sugar sweetened be beverages and curbing the marketing of unhealthy foods. <coughs> so what will work? Lisa's gone into some of the um, analyses uh, that have modelled what will work or what is possible. Um, Meta-analyses um, have shown uh, that uh, the highest quantile of intake of sugar in terms of beverages um, had the greatest risk of developing type 2 diabetes, 20% um, greater. And uh, that is significant and uh, addressing that problem will have major health consequences. Mod some modelling has been done in New Zealand uh, by Health Research Council funded groups um, and even although the reduction of daily energy intake might seem quite small, uh, that over a year is a significant um, health cost. 
and of course over the period of diabetes, which of course continues to the end of life, is a massive cost. Of course, greater taxes uh, would have greater consequences in terms of, uh, the, of averting type 2 diabetes. Um, high sugar intake is linked, and this has been clearly shown in New Zealand and worldwide studies, and the intake uh, of mostly uh, sweet uh, sugary beverages in New Zealand is significant, particularly um, amongst young children and adolescents. In fact, it's a major component of their total sh recommended sugar intake. So why are we waiting? The government has um, proposed a series of measures, particularly for childhood diabetes, but these, uh, this advice is cross-society advice, and we should endorse those measures. Every one of them uh, is, and I'm not going to put them up, they're on the Ministry of Health website, um, they are worth uh, progressing, um, including that of, of uh, getting business on side. Um, we need to action our agreement, and I understand that uh, Dr. Coleman, Minister of, of Health, uh, is either in the process of or has already signed the World Health Organization recommendations on childhood obesity, um, which include advice on taxation on sweet sugary beverages. <coughs> it is my personal view that we should introduce a delayed to let uh, business adjust, progressive tax on beverages with added sugar as the best way of changing behaviour in a timely manner. Information is a relatively slow way of changing human behaviour. And coupled with that, and despite the uh, tax problems, is the issue of putting in a carrot, encouraging people to eat healthily by taking GST off fresh fruit and vegetables. It would seem to me that this is a nice balance. Progressive, because if you have a progressive tax, this says it is not about revenue from tax. In fact, what we'd be more interested in is rapid action generating no tax. So it has nothing to do with taxation revenue. Arguments against? Lisa has gone into some of them. Ideology? We're all opposed to nanny state. Or over control of personal choice. Is the view that children need to run around more and this would solve the problem. And we know that this is uh, a small component of the problem. In fact, Kids tend to get a lot of ex exercise, or, uh, but we can certainly work on that as well. Lack of evidence that sugar taxes will achieve their goal of reducing obesity and diabetes. This is rolled out as uh, the major um, issue, uh, and, but I think we really don't have the luxury of time to sit back and wait another decade while all the evidence rolls in. I think the evidence is rock solid at the moment that sugar and junk foods are causing or contributing in a major way to the overweight obesity problem we have, which is very tightly linked to disease issues that need to be addressed now. This is the issue of gold confusion, yet another means of gathering tax, and uh, this was played out in the Dom Post, um, I think yesterday morning, and was addressed uh, by uh, um, Mark Simmons from the um, uh, Morgan Foundation uh, in the paper today. Um, and as I've mentioned, if you do this in the right way, it cannot be construed <coughs> as a revenue gathering exercise. <coughs> and there's the issue of TPPA. <coughs> Is this why government is dragging its heels on the sugar tax issue? Are there business issues that are going to complicate the issue with regard to our TPPA agreement? Um, 
I'm not an expert on this. Um, I've talked with Jane Kelsey, and it looks as though there are significant issues around this. But that should not stop us from going ahead and making our own decisions, as we did with the nuclear issue. Takeaways? Well, there's little doubt in my mind that a progressive tax on sweet, sugary beverages um, and removing complemented by removal of GST from fresh fruit and vegetables will accelerate behavioural changes that are perhaps already uh, in, uh, moving in New Zealand. <coughs> and these will address the health problems we have. <coughs> so I think with regard to health, the big health issues, we know that we need to make our body work for everything. We need exercise, we need to exercise our brain. We don't always think that we also need to exercise our digestive system by eating complex foods and by, I've got shunning sugar, but avoiding sugar if you like, um, minimizing our consumption of readily available sugar which goes straight into the bloodstream and causes major health problems. And there are other issues uh, that I'm not going to go into. I'll also add that recent polls have indicated that, and I think there are three of them, that between 66 and 82 per cent of the public are in support of a sweet sugary beverage tax. And that 84 per cent of our medics are also in this camp. So I think the scene is set for pushing a lot harder to get changes in this area that will modify behaviour, that will not be punitive in certain groups. Consider it, it's the Maori people in New Zealand who initiated and have pushed for, um, for, for tobacco taxes, and yet they are the people who are, uh, it will cost uh, the most. Uh, tobacco is a progressive, tax, it works. It's worked less well with Māori people than what we had hoped, but it works. And eventually there will be a state at which price overcomes resistance, as Lisa has pointed out. So that is my, uh, my view on this. Thank you. <coughs>